Are you thinking about building a new home? Whether this is your first home or your last home, your forever home, I want you to stop. Watch this video first. It's probably gonna save you a bunch of time, heartache, and money, regardless if you already have plans or a contractor lined up. Hi guys, my name is Garrett Glazer and I'm an engineer turned real estate investor and I actually spent two years of my life building my dream home from the ground up. Yes, did all of it myself. One of the first things that you should think about before you ever break ground is the orientation of your home on the lot. Now, just remember the sun goes from east to west, but it always has a southern tilt. So think about what's facing the south side of your house. In my case, it's the garage. Uh, many of the windows on our house are faced towards the west. However, we have a whole lot of trees on the west side of our house that shade it and shade those windows during the summer months. So that limits the amount of uh, thermal gain we get from the sun just naturally. These are the type of things that you need to think about whenever you are building your home. If you live on a large lot or you're out in the country, you have a whole lot more option than those inside the city. If you have a city lot, you may be limited as to how you can orient your house. Just remember, the sun's always on the south, work with what you got. It may be landscaping, it may be just planting some trees, that sort of thing. Whatever you can do, just remember that during the summertime, the trees have leaves, therefore they provide shade. During the winter time, they lose their leaves and you can actually get some natural thermal gain from the sun uh, in those, those exposed windows. Now that you know the orientation of your new home on your lot, it's time to think about the construction materials. What kind of walls are you gonna build? Are you gonna do just a traditional stick frame house? Are you gonna do SIPs, the structurally insulated panels? Are you gonna do ICF, insulated concrete forms? Just consider each one is a step up and so from the bottom it would be just regular stick belt. The next best would be SIPs and then the best in my opinion is ICF. With stick belt homes generally they're going to be two by four homes. You can step up to a two by six home and have R19 insulation versus R13 insulation. The problem with those is your effective R value is not R13 or R19. You have lumber in between each bat of insulation. Wood is not a good insulator, so your effective R value drops. A structurally insulated panel is just OSB or plywood glued to a rigid foam board and then screwed on to your stick built home. Uh, the benefit is you still have that R13 or R19 in those wall cavities, and then you have foam screwed onto the outside of it. So you actually have a complete thermal break all the way around your house. Now the structurally insulated panels are great with providing that thermal break, but uh, one place that they lack is in impact resistance or just extra structural strength. That's where ICF comes into play. The next option is insulated concrete form blocks. Now generally these are basically like big Lego blocks. Uh, they have two and a half inches of foam on the outside. They get uh, filled with concrete on the center could be anywhere from 4 inch to like 12 inches wide and then another layer of foam on the inside. They also have these plastic webs embedded inside of them and that's what you screw your drywall to or like your siding on the outside. ICF construction is really like the multi-tool of, of building construction. Uh, they act as your insulation, they act as uh, it could be your foundation walls in your basement or your, your walls in your main level or your second story. You can build all of them with it. They're your framing as well. So your drywall and your siding or whatever exterior covering you're gonna have can be attached to them. Another thing to consider is that with the ICF walls, you have a concrete core. It's actually a reinforced concrete core. Therefore, uh, say you're in Tornado Alley, you have an extra layer of protection between you and whatever's flying around outside. Another thing to consider is 
it's much quieter in an ICF home. You'd be amazed at the sound reduction with this method of building. Now remember that with insulated concrete forms, you have a concrete core trapped between two layers of foam. Now that concrete actually acts as a thermal mass and that thermal mass is generally pretty slow to adapt to temperature changes. So say I'm in Kansas, it can get 90 degrees one day and then down to 40 at night some other times when a cold front comes through. That big change in temperature uh, is basically held at bay by that thermal mass inside of my walls. Now there is a cost difference between these different methods for building your home. Uh, SIPs as well as the ICF are going to be a little bit more expensive, but generally they're just the same or a little more expensive than say building a 2x6 framed home. Now keep in mind with SIPs as well as the insulated concrete forms, it's going to pay for itself over time in energy savings. So it really is an investment you're gonna get your money back out of it. Plus, you're gonna have a much more consistent temperature throughout the entire house, and it's just gonna be quieter and more comfortable. Another thing to consider is the insulation whenever you're building your home. So you may have ICF walls, but that's not all the insulation you're gonna have. You're gonna need insulation in your attic, of course, and remember, use the manufacturer's recommended thicknesses to get to whatever that R value is that you're trying to get to. So whether you use fiberglass or cellulose uh, blow-in insulation in your attic, make sure that you remember that it is gonna settle over time. So put a little extra in to compensate for that settlement. Another thing to consider is the floor. Whether you have a slab home or you have a basement, you can always put rigid foam underneath that concrete slab. I placed one inch of rigid foam board underneath my slab in my basement. And there are actually a few areas where I wasn't able to put any. And whenever I was building the home before I finished the basement, you could tell the difference whenever you would walk from one spot to another that did have the insulation in it versus what didn't have the insulation and it's dramatic. Next, think about the exterior coverings on your home. Uh, you could be building with brick or stone. Just remember, those things are gonna be fairly expensive up front, but you're probably not gonna have much in the way of maintenance or replacement as time goes on. If you're considering siding your home, uh, I would recommend staying as far away from masonite as you possibly can. I can't tell you how much of that I've changed on all of my rental properties or my previous homes, but stay away from it. Instead, think about getting LP Smart Side or like a fiber cement siding. These types of sidings will hold up for quite a long time. I think most of them generally have a 50 year warranty to them and they really aren't that much more expensive than say like masonite. They are far less expensive than any sort of stone that you have out there. I would also recommend a very high quality caulk as well as paint for your home. We usually just use Sherwin-Williams for paint. Get the highest grade that you can. You won't be sorry. It will last a very long time before you have to repaint. I usually use Big Stretch for caulk. And it's, it's an elastomeric caulk and it has a whole lot of elasticity built into it so it can take those thermal changes throughout the year. Next, think about the windows that you're gonna put in your home as well as the doors. When it comes to windows, are you gonna do single hung or double hung? consider picture windows as well. They're gonna be generally the most efficient. They aren't functional, but my gosh, if you have a nice view out somewhere, make sure you put a picture window in that particular spot and direction, other than being in a, uh, a bedroom. Remember, you have to have egress. Now, when it comes to windows, you gotta think about the coatings as well as the gas inside of those windows. Remember, the more coatings, generally, the higher the performance it's going to be. Are you doing vinyl windows? Are you doing wood windows? Are you doing metal framed windows? Each one of those just goes up in price. 
Just remember, the more you spend on the windows, the higher quality windows you have, the uh, higher the effective R value is, and the more money you're gonna save in utilities as time goes on. Also, consider when the windows are installed, make sure that you tape the surrounds all the way around to, to prevent any drafts from coming in. And make sure on the inside of the windows, if there's any gaps between the window and the framing, spray foam it. Make sure that you seal everything up and remember that windows are generally the biggest source of energy loss in your home. Next, I want you to think about the roof covering that you're gonna do. If you're gonna use some sort of an asphalt shingle, is it gonna be a three tab? Is it gonna be an architectural? Is it gonna be impact resistant? Just remember, each level gets more and more expensive. Are you in a place that has a considerable amount of hail like we do here in Kansas? Uh, we went with just a traditional architectural style shingle and we understand that probably every 10 to 15 years we're going to have a large hailstorm and insurance is going to buy us a new roof. Other roofing options would be like a cement tile or a, uh, a clay tile or it could be just a, a metal standing seam roof. Um, all of those are great options, they are much longer lasting. If you have any sort of a tile roof, generally they're gonna be very heavy, so you need to think about that with your roof trusses. You're probably gonna to have to have them redesigned to carry that much weight. Another thing to think about when you're designing your roof is the overhang. Now traditionally it's gonna be a 12 inch to a 16 inch overhang off of the side of your house. Now uh, I went with a 24 inch overhang knowing that during the summertime, the, uh, the roof itself would actually shade some of my windows. So again, things to think about. In the winter time, the sun's at a much lower angle, therefore I get that nice solar gain through the windows to help heat the house. Your heating and air components are another big ticket item whenever you're building a home. Depending on your climate, you may have to have just heating or you may have to have just cooling or in my case, we have to have both. Now you can have a traditional system which has an air handler on the inside of the home and say like a condenser on the outside which just acts as air to air. So it just has a fan that pulls air through the coil and up and out. Now traditionally the minimum that the government uh, requires is like a 13 sear and that's S-E-E-R. It's just a term to measure the efficiency of the unit. The higher the number, the more efficient the unit is gonna be. Now, if you wanna step up, you could make that condenser an actual heat pump so it can shed heat to the outside during the summer or in the winter time, it can actually find heat in the air outside, bring it in and actually heat your house. The next thing I wanna talk about are geothermal uh, HVAC systems. That's what I used and I recommend it if you can afford it. They are very, very expensive. They basically get rid of the condenser that sits outside that you would normally have with a traditional system and replaces it with uh, plastic tubes that you bury in the earth. Those plastic tubes have a liquid that runs through them that uh, sheds heat in the summertime and absorbs heat from the earth during the winter time. If you're using a conventional system that has a condenser outside, uh, you're subject to the air temperature that is outside. So if it's during the summer and you're having really hot days, you're basically trying to shed heat using already hot air to blow through that condenser. And that drastically reduces your efficiency. So if you ever notice that your unit is running more and more or longer and longer during those days, that's the main reason your efficiency effectively drops. Now with geothermal, those uh, heating and cooling lines are actually buried in the ground. And as long as you have them deep enough in the ground, in my case, I buried them 10 feet deep, the temperature of the earth doesn't fluctuate nearly as much during the season. So it may be a few degrees colder in the winter than it is in the summer, but it's not 30, 40, 50, 60 degrees difference. So that's part of the reason when you have a geothermal system, it runs so much more efficiently. It has a very consistent temperature that the earth provides. As I mentioned before, the geothermal is far, far more expensive than what a traditional would be or even a heat pump system would be. 
and there are other systems out there like mini splits but i just don't know all that terribly much about them so these are the three that i have actually used in the past geothermal is generally going to be anywhere from three to four times more expensive than what a uh, conventional would be and probably two to three times more expensive than what a heat pump would be now with that said at this time the government is giving you a 30 percent tax credit uh, back on your, your total cost to install those units, those geothermal units. So that offsets quite a bit of it. Plus, your local utility many times will also give you a rebate or a credit on your bills for using this type of, uh, of HVAC system. Regardless of what HVAC system you use, those building techniques that I talked about earlier are going to dictate what the size of the unit is going to be that you're going to install. So remember, if you have a much better sealed home, it has a far higher effective R value, you can actually lower the size of the HVAC unit that is required and save quite a bit of money up front as well as electricity as time goes on. Now everything that I've talked about up to this point is designed to keep your yearly costs of maintenance down as well as your utilities down. But you're still generally going to have an electric bill or a gas bill or that sort of stuff. In my case, we didn't have gas, so it's an all-electric house. We went ahead and installed solar panels. Now my system produces 5 kilowatts of power and it uses in-phase microinverters to grid tie the system. Now this means that uh, during the nighttime when I'm not producing anything, I'm drawing off of the local utility. During the daytime when I am using some or I'm overproducing, I'm actually sending it back into the utility, running the meter backwards and getting credit for what I produce. Now solar is pretty expensive, however every single year the cost of the components keep going down. And if you can work with a, a contractor that will let you help, uh, you can save considerable costs when it goes to this. With all of my videos, I'm always going to say that it's, it's better to put the cost up front and reap those rewards down the line. It, it really is a return on investment whenever you use the right materials, you use the best methods, doesn't matter really what it is, it's going to pay for itself over time. And if you're building a home, that's one of the biggest investments that you're ever going to have. So put the time, put the money, put the thought in up front. and it's gonna pay for itself. Well, I hope that this information that I'm sharing with you brings value to your project. We had to make all of these decisions whenever we were building our house and we chose to spend the money up front, even though sometimes it was kind of significant, so that the maintenance costs and the ongoing uh, utility costs would be far, far lower in the future. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button as well as subscribe. I'll see you next time.